<laughs> wow. You know, I think there was a movie that came out a while back that says, if this is Saturday, this must be Paris or something like that. It was a comedy. I think it was amusing because I think it was Peter Sellers or somebody that, or maybe it was, gosh, I'm thinking like Doris Day or somebody, somebody really old movie. If this is such and such, this must be Luxembourg or whatever. And they remade the movie a few times. But if this is February and you're looking around at my porch and seeing all this green, this must be Hawaii. <laughs> it can't be Utah. It's interesting to me that I'm sitting outside beginning our new season, so to speak, of Utah Video Church, or Video Church, Utah's only outdoor church, recording in absolute warm weather. Now, maybe it's relative, this idea of warm weather, because it's probably 59, 60-ish. And maybe for somebody that's in Southern California, that's pretty cold, because I grew up in Southern Cal, and I remember, you know, if it's not 70 or 80, it was cold. And uh, Southern Cal is a pretty nice area for the winter. It's great for the summer. But you don't get any snow in the winter unless you drive somewhere or go somewhere. But for Utah, I'm sitting on the, right now to my left, looking out over the Wasatch Mountain Range. Wasatch! Wasatch Mountain Range. And there's snow over there. Patchy. Now, if I go to my right, I'm looking out over the Great Salt Lake. I like to say the Great Salt Lake Sea because it's kind of one of the biggest lakes in the United States. One of them, not the biggest. Matter of fact, I don't think it's anywhere near that now because it's dried up. But one time, Lake Bonneville, or Lake, I think it was called Bonneville, would have been the big one. But they changed the name, and now that it's shrunk, it's the Salt Lake. So... It's interesting to me at this time of the season that the reason I'm out here is because of climate change. You know, the climate has changed. Now, maybe you don't believe that. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm all for some of these people who say that, you know, seeing is believing. And I understand the political fallout that people used when trying to argue about climate change and, you know, global warming. And they don't like the idea that the person who gave the message was someone they didn't like and that might have had an agenda, but it doesn't mean they were wrong. Do you get the picture here? It's February, it's 60 degrees, and it's 4,000 feet up, and it doesn't do this normally, at least not within the last 100 years. So people who argue against climate change People that argue against global warming, people that haven't been to Greenland and saw how much of Greenland's ice-covered island is gone and now is exposed, people that haven't been to Iceland and seen everything melting, people that haven't lived in Alaska and seen the tundra warming, or people that haven't been in the Arctic lately and seen how warm it is during the winter, or lived in Canada and see you know, how the different frozen areas now are actually making a waterway that you can go over to Russia across the North Pole route. No, there's no global warming. What do you want to call it? Stupid? <laughs> okay, I'm stupid. I'm just sitting outside, barely wearing anything. Same clothes I'll probably wear in the summer. So whenever people tell me there's no global warming, I let them be like those conspiracy people, you know? Let them think what they want to. If you want to be stupid, be stupid. If you want to be smart, be smart. If you want to walk outside in your short sleeves and realize that, hey, what happened? I thought it was winter. Maybe that's normal for you. I guess in Southern California it is, but where I come from, we're pretty smart about looking at things and seeing, hmm, the weather changed. Jesus said something similar to that about you can look outside your door and you can see that clouds are coming and they're dark clouds and it's usually a good sign, especially in Israel, 
a good sign it's going to rain because they're a desert country and if you see dark clouds it's going to rain one way or another but knowing these things why don't you know the signs of the times why don't you know what's happening how come you're oblivious to my coming in other words when jesus came the first time and i had a discussion with this young man or actually i had an interesting discussion was a lot of times on the internet people will argue on purpose they call them flamers because what they want to do is provoke you into making a stupid statement and then they go ha i won you know you lose like a little kid and i've met a lot of adults politicians christians non-christians people that are supposed to be mature act like little kids you know the oscars you name it nowadays global warming they'll argue about anything they'll flame on and be all upset about it and then flame out because they don't really have anything to say and that's what leads me to my teaching today about gone fishing you see i got better things to do with my time than to argue with people that just want to argue i mean you you know you you probably have your own favorite things to argue about lately i've been running into people that are canoe enthusiasts and they absolutely almost port post things and portray things about me as hateful i'm dumbfounded by it i thought man i don't know anything about canoes you know i respect people that are in canoes because to me, they're teeter-totter and, you know, going to get a lot of water. You know, I mean, they're going to get water in the boat. And, I, you know, that makes your boat float, be in a canoe. But I'm not in a canoe. You know, if I had to get in a canoe, I'd get into a bigger boat. You know, like a, a skiff or something with a motor. But a lot of people like canoeing. And one of the early definitions I read about a canoe was that it was someone on their knee paddling, you know, one-handed like this, you know, which apparently is not true. But that's what I read when I first investigated canoes. And when I investigated them, I looked at kayaks, but I didn't want those polyurethane, whatever they're called, you know, that I call them plastic, other people do too, but they're not plastic. Maybe there's a few out there that are plastic, but for the most part, they're not plastic. But they're, you know, cut out of, you know, some kind of, you know, shaping device machine that you can do on a computer nowadays you know and uh, you know they're they're cheap they're inexpensive you can do white water you can play in them you can go down mountainsides on the snow on them you know i never i investigated them and i you know thought well that's kind of fun but it's not my idea of boating you know i was like once i got in it i felt trapped and then they told me that one of the first things you should learn is a barrel roll or maybe a eskimo roll and i said no nah, i don't think so so I decided, no, I'm not going to do that. So I learned about canoes and kayaks and started to talk to people about it. And I ran into this whole prideful, arrogant, stodgy type of people that were in canoes that were bragging about how superior their canoes were that, man, I just wanted to learn. You know, I mean, I was wanting to say, hey, you know, this is what I've learned about, you know, my inflatable kayaks that, you know, I like them because I can pick them up and carry them. They started telling me what I couldn't do, you know, like I can't carry my kayak with my gear or I can't tow my other kayak. I can't lift these things because I'm getting ready to go on the Mississippi River. Um, that's why I wear my hat, you know, Mississippi River trip going from the headwaters to the Gulf waters. Now, that's another interesting story is that I was on the Mississippi River site and they tell me, oh, it's source to sea because I start in a lake. And I go to, and it's the official starting point to, from the lake to the Gulf waters. And that's source to sea on the Mississippi. Now, the Missouri River starts up in the mountains and it comes down to a lake and the Forestry Service or DNR or whoever they are, you know, Department of Natural Resources, they have a park that says it's the headwaters and it's the official start of the Missouri source to sea trip. Only there are people that live there that don't call that the source to see. They get upset at you if you do. They tell you that's not source to see. The source is actually Brower Spring, which nobody can go down from. You know, you can go to this spring that's up there and 
they argued and fought about that because there was actually another spring that was supposed to be the beginning of the river that all three of those rivers that are supposed to be the beginning meet at a place that Lewis and Clark said was the beginning, but that wasn't the real beginning. So they get all into this argument kind of thing or statement kind of thing where they're the Missouri people are a little nicer about it, but still they don't want you to call it the source to see. Oh, I can't call it that. I'm like, man, does this sound like religion? <laughs> Every man has their own religion, I've always said, and sure enough, they do. Whether it be the canoeists on the Mississippi River, the kayakers in the Missouri River, or who knows what I'm going to run into when I go to the Green Spring, Green River, you know. I remember when I started the Green River run, you know, and I got in this accident and nearly killed me. I met a woman that, you know, she says she, she picked me up and gave me a ride, you know, and hurt her husband. And she said that everybody, the same boulder that I smashed on, smashes kayaks, canoes, boats, all kinds of things, you know, and she says every year we see them there, you know, and they all get smashed up and kind of broke up and, you know, they never see it coming because it doesn't look like it's going to happen to them. And I thought, huh, and that's about all I thought about it. So I don't know anything about people living on the Green River, but wow. Then I was told that I asked a guy about, you know, well, if I go from the source, the old, they call it the ultimate source, I've read that there's bob wire across the water, across the creeks. Well, yeah, there is. Really? So somebody is telling somebody not to go there, but it's okay to go there because, after all, it's legal, but still there's bob wire across it. Yeah. Last time I did that, something like that, somebody shot at me. <laughs> so I don't know. You know, people get into these funny kind of ideas that Jesus confronted them each and every one of them in his own way, directly to the point. In this year of politics, like I warned people and why I'm getting out of the ministry for a while to go down the Mississippi River, even though I'm still recording, I warned everyone it was a year of deception. And sure enough, Donald Trump or, you know, Christie or, gosh, Rubio or Cruz or... Um, Hillary Clinton, you know, I mean, these are the names that are people that are running. Well, they're all politicians, so that means they all compromise, they all lie, they all do whatever they have to do in order to get in office. Now, I find it interesting that Mr. Trump is an example of the Antichrist. It's just one of those factual things because he's used hate, he's used money, he's used greed, he's used anger, he's used volatile tricks in the book to convince people to vote for him, which is kind of what the Antichrist will do, except he'll do it in a less obvious way. But it is one of the ways that like people like Hitler and Mussolini and other people that used anger and violence to get into office did it. That's how they did it. And they would tap into the underlying anger or the base nature of humanity. Now, some people think that human beings are born, you know, Babies are born innocent, not according to the Bible. Some people think that, you know, children are innocent, not according to the Bible. And some people think that, you know, there's good in the land or good in people, not according to the Bible. I mean, don't get me wrong. I've met people that normally in the old days I would have called good, but Jesus said there's none good. So I have to look at their motives. I have to look at their heart to determine where they're coming from so that I know where they're going, because if they're leading me, I don't want somebody leading me over a waterfall. I don't want somebody leading me over a cliff. I don't want somebody like the lemmings running as fast as they can towards this cliff and just going right over to the ocean and drowning. And that's what lemmings do once a year sometimes or once every five years or something. You'd have to watch a National Geographic special to remember that. Or Hannah's Barbera's or whatever, you know, Wild Kingdom, you know, whatever it was in the old days. But I remember that about lemmings. They just ran and followed the leader. And that's what you have to be careful of. If you're picking a leader to follow, or if you're into voting, which I'm not, then what do you do in following the leader when you already have one? In other words, I'm going fishing when it comes to the elections because I'm not voting, because they're not my leader. I'm not a politician. I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I mean, I'm barely an American citizen because I was born here, but they tell me that because 
my citizenship is in heaven. It's not on earth. So I have, I guess, a dual citizenship for some people, but for me, it's only one. My citizenship is I'm looking for a land whose city and whose foundation is built without hands. That, according to the scriptures, is what Jesus said we should be looking for. That is what Jesus said we should be talking about. That is what Jesus said we should be doing. Now, maybe, since I don't fish, maybe my kind of fishing is doing a little bit different than your kind of fishing. You know, it's kind of like the canoe people, you know, they talk about, well, you know, we're going to, you know, take our canoe out, you know, and we're going to say hi to everybody that's always so friendly. We're going to wish everybody the best going down the Mississippi River. I mean, I even have this one site, Mississippi River Paddlers. That's what they say. You know, we're here to encourage you. We're here to tell you just how easy it is or how wonderful it is. And we're going to show you the best way to do these things. The cat is out of the hat. <laughs> okay. They are if you're a canoeist. Now, maybe if you're a sea kayaker, they might let you get away with some stuff because there's a lot of sea kayakers on that site. But I'm an inflatable kind of guy. I kind of like the pneuma, as they say, of the Holy Spirit inflating me, you know, kind of filling me up and making me like full of peace, full of love and full of, hey, we got joy. <laughs> I got this joy, 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 joy down here in my heart. Where? But seriously, being filled with the Holy Spirit makes me think of my kayak filled with hot air, or air in this case, which is what pneuma means in the Greek for what we're talking about, the Holy Spirit. Now really, when we say filled with the Holy Spirit, it's supposed to be overflowing. It's supposed to go outward. So, you know, I, I kind of play with that analogy for myself. I don't teach it because I know that there's somebody out there that's going to get critical about it and kind of try to make a hermeneutic and homiletic about it and I'll have to argue with them theologically. Don't get me wrong, I can eat people alive in theology. No problem. I mean, you want to go there? Great. Tell me what your parameters are because already I don't have any. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, God is God and theology is box and as soon as we start saying box and try to put God into a box, Somebody's getting stupid about it, and that's usually what theology is. Being a little bit stupid about what your presumptions are and who you're assuming them about. <laughs> I'd rather hear what God has to say about himself than to present my argument about what I think God is. And systematic theology has a serious logic problem if you go that route. You may want to examine the premise of studying about God as opposed to God revealing himself. I came up with the idea of integral specificity because of that reason. So I don't go by systematic theology. Can't see it being truthful. So I go by integral specificity. Just my own personal point of view. I know Jews don't go by systematic theology either. <laughs> but they don't go by integral specificity either. They have their own logical way of looking at things. And it's not quite what you think it is. So, here we go back to Jesus. People having their idea of when he was coming, how he was going to come, what he was going to do. They screwed up. They didn't see him coming. He's standing right in front of them. They didn't get it. They didn't understand him. They had their own idea of how Jesus was going to say things, how Jesus was going to do things, and how Jesus was going to be. So Jesus says, look, this is how my father is. Now, they'd already come up with the idea that God was holy. Well, that's good. They already came up with the idea that God was righteous. Well, that's good. And they already came up with the idea that God was just, and that was good. They had a picture or an idea of God. You know, they were in a canoe, so to speak, heading down the river. But then they saw people in kayaks, and they said, I don't know, we can't have them in the boat. And they had their own canoe that they were going down. Well, Jesus said, hey, I want you to get out of the boat. They looked at Jesus and said, nah-uh. And so they kept going down the canoe, and, you know, such as it is their journey, Jesus says they'd be the last to enter the kingdom of heaven. And so they're going into great tribulation. Now, 
the people that were in the kayak, they were like, we don't know what we're doing. We're just playing. And Jesus says, get out of the boat. Well, some of them did, some of them didn't. So the ones that did, Jesus said, hey, walk with me. And some of them walked on water. Until they looked around and said, we can't do this. And splash, splash, they were taking a bath. But the reality of it not being the kayak or the canoe was about the mindset. The people's idea of how they wanted to box God and make him into their own image. Today, politics is the same way. People want to make politics a certain way to sell a product. They present themselves as, well, we're going to give you this, and we're going to give you that, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do that. Those guys aren't going to do the good. And then they turn around, and they work with those guys. I mean, you've got a president candidate that says, oh, we got to get everybody in office, out of office, so that I could take over. Kind of sounds like a dictator, but the truth is, we've already seen, oh, I don't know, 40 presidents at least or more. I can't know. I don't even know how many presidents there's been now. But they, uh, all of them have said, you know, that they could do something that they couldn't do because they had to get along with the other guys that had to do. In other words, there's three parts to, you know, making a bill and doing these things in Congress that you can't get them to agree on any more than reelecting or electing any one person will do. And yet here we are, everyone arguing about what they're going to do. Then they have to, you know, go to cheap shots. So, if I were a businessman, and I don't mean like Donald Trump, he's kind of like one of those, he learned business, but he learned how to manipulate businesses, you know, kind of like make them fail so that he could get a tax credit, take the money, and then turn the money around and reinvest it somewhere else in order to have that fail because it's a different kind of bankruptcy, and then you can make money off of that and go on and up and up and up and up and make your millions or million. Well, he's pretty smart that way. You know, I mean, he learned how to manipulate the tax system, tax codes. But if I were a businessman, there's a thing called the law of diminishing return. It's called return on investment. It's called investing and getting back, or like Jesus would say, you reap what you sow. I like the way Jesus says reaping and sowing because you can see around you all these plants growing. Now, people told me that I can't grow these. My wife told me I can't grow these. I can't even remember what they're called, but she said I can't grow them. Well, every year I take them inside and I grow them. And I bring them back outside and they're all over the place. They're monsters. They grow like crazy. Different plants that I have, you know, I cut them up and make them into tall trees. You know, you can't see one behind you, but it's reaching up to the ceiling. Or I should say, yeah, the ceiling of the porch, I guess. You know, it's going grow it upward, which normally grows along the ground but I made it grow up instead of growing down. Changed its nature, so to speak, or used its nature to go upward instead of downward. Think about that. But when we talk about following someone and you're talking about voting for someone and you're talking about getting angry about it and you're talking about dividing people about it, I think maybe you should go fishing. No, really, I mean, there's a lot of people that go fishing. I mean, you know, they put on this kind of outfit and they got like pockets for everything, you know, lures, hooks, line, different kinds of hooks for different kinds of fish, different kinds of shiny stuff and rubbery stuff and flexible stuff and stuff to trick fish into biting. You know, here, take a bite out of this. Here, try this, you know, and you hook it on, you tie it on, you know, and you go like that and you throw it in there, you know, and you kind of go, you know, and you try to hook that sucker. Hook, line, and sinker. Isn't that a lot like politics? You know, you get hooked on it. You know, they throw you out a little line here and a line there. and you know, Oh, no, they're, they're the best for the country. Really. Now, I'm kind of interested that I've got a lot of Christian friends that I don't know where their Christianity went because when it comes to politics, they're not Christian. They think they are. They call themselves Christian, but they don't act like it. I see politicians who tell me they're Christians, like, you know, Mark Rubio is supposed to be a Christian. And he says, oh, well, Donald Trump's got, you know, problems with his hair or problems with his face, you know. And I think, if he's a Christian, then he must be a carnal Christian. Right? I mean, we don't 
knock each other, right? Isn't that the truth? We're supposed to be loving our enemies and loving our friends? Well, you won't get you elected that way. Interesting. Will it or won't it? Hook, line, and sinker. You know, throwing you a hook. Throwing you a line. Throwing you what truth the world tells you is true. But I kind of like my version of fishing. You see, when the elections come in 2016, and I told you, the Lord's not coming back this year. There's no doubt about that part. That's the easy one. 17, eh, yeah, you can start looking around. 18, probably, but 17 or 18 or 19 or 20, 21, 22, right around in there somewhere. But this year, no. People still have to fail in order to, to succeed. And sometimes that's the way it works. Sometimes you got to fail in order to succeed. I mean, I failed at a lot of things, you know, in my mind. God said they were successes, but I considered them failures, you know, and I guess you'd have to decide for yourself which is right, God or me. <laughs> Good question. So, in how God does things and how God works things, we have to kind of ask him, based upon his own words, what he means. Because even Jesus said, look, you search the scriptures and you think you know them and that they are what you say is about God, but I'm here to tell you all about my father. And you don't even know who your father is, and yet you're telling me about my father. So Jesus had an argument going on with the religious leaders of his day. Even like today, you'll hear people talk about Jesus. They tell me about the person I know. They say, no, Jesus didn't love the enemies. You know, he was more like you love those that are, you know, like you keep that in the back of your mind. But, you know, if they attack you, you kill them. You know, you shoot them. You beat them up. You protect your family. You arm yourself. You put on your armor, you know, the full armor, you know, which isn't, you know, like the shield of faith or the helmet of salvation or the breastplate of righteousness or the belt of truth or the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Or the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. No, oh, you know, you got to go out and get your Glock. And you got to put on your Kevlar vest. And you got to put on your, you know, helmet with the 3D imagery so that you can zoom in on that sucker and blow his brains out. Really? That's your Jesus? Jesus Christ. <laughs> that could start me swearing. <laughs> And yet, that's the American Jesus. I mean, the people that are voting now, the people that are trying to start churches or mega churches or make you money, I, I know Dave Ramsey, you know, God bless you. If you think that's Christianity, uh-uh, man, I got news for you. How hard is it for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven? Ask how easy it is for him to give up his mansion. He got it now, he ain't gonna get it later, sorry. That's not the way God operates. He don't bless you out of your mind and say, hey, take your money and run with it, buddy. Yeah. I think he wanted you to invest in the kingdom of God, not divest yourself into your own personal interests. You know, mansions, money, television programs. You know, hey, I'm going to get you out of debt. Hey, news for you. Want to get out of debt? Spend more. <laughs> it's basically what it means. I mean, that's what God said. Spend more of his money, not yours, because you don't have any money, but he does. And I don't mean a thousand cattle on, on every hill. I mean, what isn't God's? Mammon, probably, because you made it, you got it, you give it, you got, you created it, and it's whatever is in your image, but that's fine. You know, if you think that's not from God originally, okay. Might have deviated along the way, and that's why God doesn't want to have anything to do with your mammon. But, hey, it's okay. If you want to be a Dave Ramsey, go be a Dave Ramsey and try to make a bunch of money. Maybe that's how Trump got his way. I only know this. Find me a rich Christian. I don't see them entering into the kingdom of heaven. I really don't. I see them very concerned about their family, very concerned about their money, and how they can use their money for certain reasons. They don't say they're going to sell all they have take up their cross and follow Jesus. They don't sound like the Jesus freaks that I used to know that they sold out, I'll agree, and become just like those who they said they weren't going to become like. 
the religious leaders of their day who were prosperous and they were building their own mega churches. I mean, I remember the hippies. I remember, you know, Greg Laurie. I mean, I remember, you know, Keith Green. I remember Lon Lonnie Frisbee. A lot of people that were like, hey, we're sold out for Jesus. And I wonder what they're sold out to now. I mean, you know, thank God Greg's sharing the gospel. But what else? I don't know. Just saying. You better be careful who you follow. Because Greg isn't following necessarily you. He isn't necessarily following someone else's teaching, like Chuck. He's following what he sees his Lord telling him to do. I hope. My Lord and Savior Jesus is telling me what to do. Now, I'm not out there making money. You know, I'm not out there, you know, trying to build a church. I'm not out there trying to build a better mousetrap, an evangelistic one, or even a technological one, like with Didivo. But what God tells me to do is go fishing. Well, okay, but I don't know how to fish. <laughs> and that's the point we're at. You see, I don't know how to fish. I, I grew up with, you know, I worked at this trout farm, you know, for a bunch of Mormons, but, you know, this trout farm where they had these big ponds, you know, that were stocked full. I mean, about every, once a month they would come and dump like 10,000 fish in this little tiny area. We had to keep going out every night, you know, and throw fish bait in there so they could eat. But, you know, they had nice, beautiful trout in there and people would bring a pole with a hook on it. You could just drop the hook in and they would catch a fish. I mean, that's how easy it was. And so we would clean them and bag them and ice them. And you'd take your little kid, you know, and he'd just like take the pole out, daddy, daddy, you know, and they'd throw them out there and girls, boys, dogs, cats, you know, you name it, whatever was throwing the hook in the pond, they'd catch fish. There's no doubt, no problem. I mean, guaranteed fish come, you know, that's why we had no problem saying 100% guaranteed, you'll take home a fish because we charge by the pound. You know, we clean them and whatever, and then weighed them and you know, packed them in ice for you and you took them home in a little bag, kind of like the old goldfish thing. Well, you know, that was kind of interesting to me. That was my first experience with fishing until I went to Alaska. And then how I caught a fish was I stuck my thumb in its gill and I picked it up. And it was about this big and it was heavier than all get out. And I had my thumb in it. I carried it down to my sister's house and she told me that was the king salmon. After that, I started flicking fish out of the river with boards. I started telling my dogs to go grab them and they'd pick them up and carry them out of the creek. So... I really don't know how to fish. I got spoiled. I had monster fish, gigantors, and they assist in a fishing store. But you see, that's not the kind of fishing that Jesus wants me to do. It's not the kind of fishing that I want to do. It was too easy. It was simple. It was so abundantly prevalent, other people want to go do that kind of fishing. Well, some of them stand on shores, you know, the tourist spots. They line up all up and down the river, and they're like, shoo, shoo. You know, and they're hooking and snagging and cheating and conniving and trying to get their load or limit or whatever. I remember where I lived, I just grabbed the fish and ate it, you know, and I was happy, you know, and I was pretty much done. But that's not how they fish. Okay, let them fish, which is what I did. So when I came back down and God told me to go fishing, I really didn't understand what he meant. And then when I'd been you know, kind of like out of boats with other people fishing and kind of sitting there going, what do you think about God? People would say, well, I don't know. Everybody's got their own opinion. I said, well, did you ever ask them? Well, no. You ever thought about it while you're fishing? Nah. Do you know that's how Peter got saved? Huh? Yeah, you know, Peter is a fisherman. Really? Yeah, he's this old burly guy. He used to get drunk on weekends, you know, it's kind of, Huffing and puffing, you know, and working his butt off, you know, and pissed off at people, you know, kind of mouthy, you know, and kind of rough around the edges. So, you know, and then uh, one of his brothers, you know, who worked with him at one time, you know, said, boy, if there's ever anybody needs to get saved, Peter's the one. He kind of brought Jesus to Peter. Jesus says, hey, Peter, you ever gone fishing? Well, that didn't go over too well. So Jesus says, throw your nets on the other side. Peter says, Give me a break. You're some kind of holy man. And I've listened to my brother talk about you. Ain't no way I'm throwing my nets on the other side of the boat. Because after all, everybody threw their nets on the right side, not the left side. I mean, there's a certain way you get on a horse, right? 
you don't get on the wrong side, you get on the right side, so to speak. So finally, you know, Jesus says, fine, don't do it. Peter does it, catches more fish than he ever caught in his life, pretty much, because his boat almost sank. No fisherman wants to have your boat sink, but he was so thrilled, he yanked them in anyways. And they're a different kind of fishing, but they were pulling in the nets, you know, and it's like, oh my God, look at all these fish. And Peter, you know, was kind of cussing and swearing, I'm sure, while he's pulling in the fish, and then realized, he looked over at Jesus and saw someone as pure as Jesus was, as humble as Jesus was, as tender as Jesus was, and he thought, that guy's not a fisherman. That guy's holy. And so he said, you know, go away from me. You know, I, I, I'm just a sinner. I'm nobody special. I, I, I can't handle you. You know, you're, you're too much whatever you are. Peter, knowing what kind of man he was, Jesus just looked at him and said, follow me. And he did. As rough as he was. As crass as he was. Even as drunk as he got later. And once in a while got drunk. Yes, Peter got drunk. Come on, he's Jewish. The point being is this. Peter knew how to fish, but Jesus was teaching him how to fish for men. How to go fishing for those that God was calling into the kingdom of heaven. Those that God would cast a net out into the world and bring in those whom he wanted. That delectable type of fish. That maybe you have a certain kind you like. You know, or sushi. <laughs> I don't know. Go figure. I like salmon. Just, you know, kind of like roll it up in butter and <laughs> salt and bake it. That's the way I do it, basically. I just like fish that's salty and tastes like fish. Kind of. So, although I did have deep fried salmon, deep fried whatever they are, you know, little bite sized deep fried things. But the point being, Jesus. Being that he was who he is, and that he knew that Peter was more than what he appeared to be, chose to have him follow him. Now, I don't know about you. I know there are a lot of people that have peculiar interests, you know, especially in this world. They have politics, you know, they have pot, they have drugs, they have sex, they have all kinds of things that they have to do. They got to. I mean, if you ever met somebody that's hooked on pot, you know they got to smoke. They got to toke. They can't get away from it. They can't quit. They just can't. So they invent all kinds of reasons and excuses and make up this and make up that. But they're in bondage. They're chained. They're addicts. But that doesn't mean that other people aren't addicts too. Like, look at all the politicians and people that are into politics. Are they happy? Are they enjoying life or are they addicted to their own type of drug you know humanism democracy supposedly republicans democrats independents you know playing the game to get the fame to get their name in that peculiar role of being an elected official and by the way there are a lot of perks that go with that but saying all that is that really the kind of person you would want to be? I look at any of them and I say, I don't want to be that. I don't want to be that. Then I look at the voters and I say, I don't want to be that. What is it that you want to be? I mean, to put it bluntly, Peter wanted to be a fisherman and so he just made a living. But every time he made a living, Matthew, the tax collector, kept taking part of his living and he was pissed off about that. He was so mad, matter of fact, that Jesus, quite frankly, to teach Peter about love and forgiveness, ask Matthew to come along too. Now that must have been an interesting event. Jesus of Nazareth, the movie, actually shows one night Peter drunk coming to Matthew's house where Jesus was invited and listening to Jesus tell a story about the prodigal son. And the beauty of it is, is seeing Peter drunk, you know, mad, dealing with the reality of what Jesus is saying and struggling in his mind. And Matthew, so empty, knowing that his life was meaningless because he had what he wanted, you know, partying money, stone, getting drunk, getting women, getting loose and goose and having all these party friends. 
both of them realizing how empty their lives were and how meaningful what Jesus was saying was. That they were willing to learn more. They wanted to know more. They wanted to experience more of what Jesus was saying. So they followed him. And that's kind of what I am as far as fishing is concerned. I'm not interested in everybody getting saved. I'm sorry, nobody will. I mean, to put it bluntly, if you're out there to save the world, you're not going to save the world. That's just the way it works. But God has said that the world isn't going to get saved. Matter of fact, most of the world's going to hell in a handbasket because that's what they want. A lot of people actually really want to go to hell. A lot of people don't know how to get out of going to hell, but most of the people want to because they have heard or dealt with God in some way. And they absolutely refuse to give up that independent, mean, bitter streak they got for whatever reason. Now, I can pray for them, you know, and I can love on them. That doesn't mean they're going to get saved. I just say, hey, you know, this is their heaven. Leave them alone. If this is all they get, let them have what they got. You know, and that includes people like Trump. I mean, most of the wealthy people I know and I've worked for, at some point in time, I've had to say, you know, I don't see them going to heaven. And no matter what I say or do, they just aren't interested. They have their own God and they're serving it well because it was never the living God, even if they were religious or even if they were in church. It was always about somehow turning back to themselves. They were possessed by their possessions. They were dispossessed of God because they had crossed a line somewhere. And I guess that's where mercy and grace comes in. Mercy and grace is kind of like the lures of fishing. It's kind of like God's equipment that he uses in order to hook a man and bring him in, reel him in. You see, God's word goes out and it does, in fact, accomplish its purpose. Whether it be for righteousness or condemnation, that's up to the person. But God's word will still accomplish, one way or the other, a person making a decision. They'll hear it, they'll accept it, or they'll reject it. And after enough hearing, they'll get dull of hearing and they don't want to hear it no more. Kind of like, you know, people argued so long about global warming, they don't believe it, even though it's happened now. Well, when they tried to manipulate it as a political reason, it became one of those sky is falling things. And that's the way it is with Jesus' return. People have heard that Jesus is coming for so long and he didn't. People are deciding he's not coming back at all including those that are still saying it. They live their lives like he's not coming back, but they tell you that, well, we need to teach the uh, doctrine of imminent return. You know, imminent meaning that it's going to happen real soon, but we're not making any plans on it. We're just teaching that. We're not, we'll live our lives as though Jesus is watching or God is watching and that we need to, you know, be on the list that Santa Claus is taking that we're doing right and not wrong, but we don't really believe he's coming back soon. I mean, <laughs> after all, I mean, you know, if he was, we might have to, you know, like do something more rather than something less. And besides, we have too many things to do right now. You know, we've got our ministry, our family, our kids, our church, our religion, our ideas about God, rather than talking directly to him or learning to listen to him. So my idea in Video Church is that I really am not interested in going down the Mississippi River for the canoe people. I'm not interested in going down the Mississippi River for the kayak people. I'm not going down the Mississippi River for really any other reason except I'm learning how to fish. How to kick back, relax, and let God fish for me. Because I know that there are places on the Mississippi River that I saw fish jumping over the boat. Well, I got me a little net, you know, one of those little hand nets. And if I see a fish jump over my bow, I'm putting my net out and catching it. Because it's getting to the time where people that are hungry, that want God, will search for God. It's getting to the time where people that don't want God are more than the people that want God. So I'm just kind of like going, okay, you know, you go do your thing. You want to go to hell, go to hell. You want to go to heaven? Talk to me, you know, I'll tell you what you can do. But I'm not going to lead you there. I'm not going to, you know, carry you. I'm going to show you what you can do. I'm going to explain to you how you can discover for yourself 
uncover what it is and what it means to follow Jesus. Medieval church, we've always said that it's the word of God by the spirit of God to the people of God of the son of God, Jesus, because except God draw a man unto himself, he shall not be saved. I don't care how much you think your intellect or your intelligence is going to guide you or lead you. It's only the spirit of God that brings you to God. No one can know God except that God draws him unto himself. And Jesus said no one can know the Father except that he reveals him to that person. So we've got the Holy Spirit and we got Jesus working on the hard part. And my part is just simply, hey, you want to know about God? I can tell you all about him. You want to know about fishing? I'm not so good. You know, you want to know about, you know, kind of like inflatable kayaks? I might be able to teach you a little bit. But frankly, I'm more about peace, love, and joy and enjoying what God is bringing to me every day than I am about politics and voting and, you know, arguing and acting like, you know, oh, this election is so much different than the last one and the last one and the last one and the last one and the last one. The economy is so much different than the last one and the last one and the last one and the last one. I've been around for 40 years watching this. Nothing has changed. They're still playing games of keeping themselves distracted because the world has attracted them unto itself. It's one way of keeping yourself busy rather than understanding what's happening behind the scenes. And I don't mean conspiracy. I mean, look up, look out. The weather's changing. God is coming. If that's not an obvious sign that you need to pay attention, I can't give you any more obvious signs than that except for the birth of Israel. And even that people reject now. They go, no, that's not a sign of his coming. Global warming is, and that's the whole world. So if you didn't like the sign of Israel becoming a nation, take a look around you. What do you call global warming? Man-made? Yeah, right. Got news for you. Not only is Jesus is coming, but he's coming back sooner than you think. And frankly, he ain't coming back like, you know, well done, now good and faithful servant. He's coming back more likely, uh, except those days be shortened, man would deceive himself. Don't get me wrong, I believe in the rapture, you know, and boy, is that a disaster. I mean, there are people that are teaching about a rapture disaster, that somehow the whole world is going to believe in Jesus because there's a rapture disaster that comes after God saves a whole bunch of people. I can't find that, but that's okay. It's supposed to be in the Bible. It's not there, but it's supposed to be. They make, you know, well, it doesn't say that, but it implies it. Yeah implies gotcha just like you know how the jews thought they knew jesus until he came implies when jesus said things about the rapture he didn't say you know let's go teach the rapture no he didn't say you're going in the rapture no as a matter of fact he wrote letters to the seven churches and warned them about his second coming i'm not happy with you i'm not happy about this i'm not happy about that Matter of fact, you better do this and you better do that. Those are in the letters to the seven churches. Seven churches are seven different types of churches. That means everybody's covered. You know, it's all of us, every one of us. And different people inside those churches were told to do different things. Most of them were told they were going to die. You're going to die. Sorry, this is the way it's going to be. But in your death, you'll have eternal life. Well, that's a good deal. You know, the suffering part's not so good, but... At least you're told it's going to happen. But you see, most of the people that are involved in rapture theology, which is what it's called now, the idea that they get to escape without any cost. You know, it doesn't require anything of them. You know, never mind the parable of ten virgins. You know, ah, that doesn't apply to us. That's the unsaved and the saved. But everybody that's saved, oh yeah, you know, we're going. Whew. Exit plan, stage left, right, up, down, whatever. But that's not what Jesus said. You see, it's who you follow. If you're following, you know, a Hagen or a Hagee or, you know, some religious Jewish prophet you think is in America, you know, harbinging this and bring and, you know, shemeeting that and, you know, believing this and, you know, dominating that, you know, and rotating and, you know, gyrating, then you're really just following a man and his plan, which is to get more fame and fortune. And that's what he does. You know, if you like that, go for it. 
But I can tell you this. I'm a little bit like Paul in one way. I know what kind of sinner I am. Man, I struggle with sin. I fight sin. I lose at sin. I, you know, sin's got me and sin wins at times. And sometimes God wins. You know, I'm kind of like, kind of like this double helix, you know, mixture of my DNA's RNA because that's where sin resides. My flesh is sinful. And as long as I'm living in this particular body, I'm a sinner, but I hopefully can be saved by grace. God can look at me and say, he can't help himself, save him. You know, God bless you, Michael, you're okay. You know, because you believe my son, because you accept my son, because you follow my son, because my son said he's got you and that he will take care of you and that he'll provide for you and that you'll do what he says and he'll be, he'll be your Lord. You'll, he's your Lord and you're following him and he's my son. I'll take care of the rest. God says. And so God, his father of Jesus, takes care of me by grace because I've asked Jesus into my life. I've asked Jesus to take care of my I've asked Jesus not into, but to overwhelm, take over, control, and be the Lord of my life. And he did. Does that mean every day I do what he says? No, but I try. You know, and sometimes I succeed, sometimes I fail. Does that mean I'm being raptured? I don't know. I know this. Paul said, pray to be counted worthy, not expect that you're worthy. Pray to be counted worthy, to be spared of these things that are coming upon the world. I know praying to be counted worthy, to be spared, doesn't mean that you're going to be raptured. It might mean that you're killed in an instant, which would be kind of nice. Poof! In the twinkling of an eye, you drop dead. That's kind of a nice idea. Now, you may think that's a little morbid, but I think that's wonderful. Because maybe you aren't going to be raptured, but at least you're going to be exit stage right instantaneously. Just like the rapture is, you know, in the twinkling of an eye. But it'll happen so fast for you, you won't even know. Because there you are, in the air, with all the other saints. Everybody. And I know you don't know how that works, but that's okay. I do. But the reality of... What Jesus said about this rapture theology wasn't about the rapture. It was about looking for him, seeing him, talking about him, doing his will be done, not yours. I'm sorry. Wherever the finger points isn't right unless you got it straight up. Because it's not about you, baby. Uh-uh. Frankly, it's his story, not your story. You may have a testimony. You may have been saved from something, but you're supposed to be saved to something. You know, you got out of drugs. I'm wonderful, thankful. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Be at peace. Do your thing. But you're supposed to be going to something. You know, my, my greatest testimony that I try to tell people isn't about what I was, although I got to admit, <laughs> Even I have a problem with that. I go, man, I was walking on water. <laughs> now, I'm, now I'm standing on stony ground. I mean, Rrr. you know, sometimes I feel like, wow, I went from, yeah, you know, up here, you know, that's the way I feel. I didn't say that's the way it is. But reality check is, yeah, I mean, I, a glow and go and everything else. I was like, wow. I mean, just, I mean, that's all I can tell you. Wow. I can tell you more about it, but then you might want that rather than that. He's coming soon. And so that's what really, for me, it's not about what was. And in reality, it isn't just about what is, but it's what shall be. In other words, it's all of this. It is my testimony and my daily living, but it's my future destiny. In other words, I am that I am that I am, is what he said. He was, he is, he ever shall be. It's what was, what is, and what is coming to be. It's all of these that God said his name was. And that's what God in you is. Eternity. Right now. Living in eternity exists for me at this moment. I don't have to be raptured. I'm already living in eternity. I'm already raptured. I've had rapturous moments all the time. And I don't mean only in worship. <laughs> you know? Some people get raptured when they become enraptured when they hook a fish. You know, right? 
<laughs> the whole idea of fishing, I'm not sure that I get. But okay, you know, I kind of got it. You know, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm just not a fisherman. But God has got me fishing. So maybe I'll get it on the Mississippi or the Missouri or the Green. Actually, Green River is what I'm looking forward to, but okay, you know. Missouri's got me interested. It kind of got some beautiful countryside. I think it's kind of barren like the Green River, but, you know, there's just interesting to me different areas that really, when it came to being outdoors, I actually love Oregon. <laughs> Go figure. Green trees. You know. um, but, you know, I'm, I, you know, I get the idea about all these rivers that people are telling me that where they're at, like the people on the Mississippi are telling me what they like and what they can do and what they've done. Now, they're always telling me what I can't do, you know, which is interesting because God has told me I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So that means I can do anything. I, I have a problem with it. Go down Mississippi River, no problem. I mean, I told people that. You know, I was like, hey, you know, I just... Based upon my experience, you know, of all the things that I've already done in my life, Mississippi is going to be easy. <laughs> be perfectly blunt. It's going to take some time, but it's easy. It's just like living life every day. I'm living on the Mississippi instead of living here. So whatever comes my way, I have to deal with it. But they take it as a, you know, kind of like a, a trip. You know, well, man, remember that day, you know, when we were camping out, you know, on the Mississippi River and, you know, we had to portage. It was so hard. Oh, yeah, I remember that. You too. Yeah, it was terrible for us. And I'm more like, well, that was the day that God spoke to me and I was walking along, you know, talking to people and telling them about going down Mississippi River and that I'm kind of like a Mississippi River preacher, you know, I just talk about God and talk about Jesus and talk about this, that and the other thing and talk about my boat, my kayak, my family, my friends, and, you know, kind of things like that, you know, I'm just relating and, and you know, I mean, every day I kind of do the same thing anyway, so it's kind of like, well, I don't see portaging as a bad thing, but they do, you know. They keep arguing about it because they're so long, of 17 feet long boats. Can you imagine that? I, I mean, don't get me wrong. My 12 foot boat is sitting in my my apartment. When I blow it up, it takes up the whole room. I look at that and I go, 17 feet, I can't even do 12 feet. My 10 foot kayak takes up the whole room. So, you know, maybe for them it's like, you know, I don't know not as appreciative of all of it. Well, I'm thrilled for the portaging, for the storms, for the wind, for the other boats, for everything, because God sent them. It's kind of like in politics, you know, you're going to be faced with bad choices this year. I mean, really, you are. No matter who you look at, you got a bad choice. I mean, my choice is easy. I can choose to get involved in all that junk, or I don't. I go fishing. And I guess for you, if you don't want to, you know, go fishing, and you really are excited about getting political, you really want to be separated into little groups, you know, and do your little, you know, like, oh, I'm for these guys, but not those guys, and I don't like those guys, and I hate these guys, and I'm a Christian. Okay, because I already know, you know, I've seen so many Christians failing the test that God sent with President Obama. God's put President Obama in office for a lot of reasons, you know, don't get me wrong. I personally think that, you know, America needed a wake-up call about its health care system, and I did a good job, you know what I mean? Because I remember the welfare systems from all the way up, because I've been having to use, let's call it, instead of welfare systems, let's call it medical insurance systems. And I've seen them in the past, in the present, in the future, you know. Personally, I'd rather have God heal me than, you know, deal with the government, but, oh well. And having been a part of all this, you know, I go, so you think it was better before he started this? No. There were hospitals refusing people and letting them die in their parking lot. It wasn't legal, but it was done. Ask any emergency room. Yes, it was. Or people dying on their way from one emergency room to another. Oh, sure, we stabilized them, but they still died on the way. Now, you can't do that. You know, it's about medical. It wasn't, you know... Hippocrates' oath didn't work in America because America had learned how to make money off of Hippocrates because they became hypocrites instead. So we had the president put into office maybe just to help the poor people, which he did. Now, 
I personally think God wanted to demonstrate the hardness of men's heart when he put President Obama into office. And I can say this, the majority of Christians I know failed, including Greg Laurie. Greg Laurie and Billy Graham came out and said, you know, you can't vote for President Obama because after all, he's not a Christian or something like that. And said, you know, you have to vote for Mitt Romney, a Mormon. And I remember it very clearly because I came right out and said, hey, if that's the choice, you don't vote because they're trying to tell you to separate on the basis of bias, prejudice, and not vote for a Christian because they don't like him. Pastors and evangelists. Now, that was evil. It was the manifestation of evil, and it was a bad choice, a wrong choice, and those ministries suffered for it for a few years, and then they kind of, you know, been back to their basics again, and now they're doing the right thing, I pray. But if they get involved back into politics, then they failed, you know? I mean, I'm sure they're still political because I saw Greg doing a Rubio thing, you know, and I was like, well, they never learn. Because it's not about politics. God puts in office whom he chooses. You know, he sets up governments. It's not man doing it. It's God doing it. You can think that your vote counts, but the truth is, people count your votes, but your vote doesn't count. It's the way it works. People count votes. Your vote doesn't count. Yeah. It may sound like a practical reality when it comes to physiology, but it's true also in the type of environment you think about voting, that doesn't count. It doesn't matter. Sorry. What matters is the spiritual reality of how God elects officials and puts them in office and what his purpose is and plan is there. Because God allowed Pontius Pilate. God allowed Nero. God allowed all these different people and put people there to witness to him. Now, you can tell me that, you know, you're some kind of Christian evangelist that you believe that Christian politics is about going into office, being in office, compromising, lying, cheating, stealing, and using your office in order to do things so that you can witness to everyone else. But what are you witnessing to? Paul didn't go to Nero and become a Roman citizen in order to witness to Nero and then become corrupted. No, Paul died after witnessing to Nero. That's how Christian politics works. It's not about being like them to get to them. No, it's about being what God has called you to be in order to do what God wants you to do. And that's not Christian sports, it's not Christian athletics, it's not Christian this, baseball player, football player. It's about being and following Jesus. So I don't care what your vocation is. I don't care if you're a football player, a basketball player, black, white, yellow, green, purple, upside down, right side up. I don't care if you're Donald Trump. I don't care if you're Hillary Clinton. If you're following Jesus, you know what you should do. And it's pretty obvious to me who is and who isn't. Just like it's obvious to me that I'm sitting out on a deck. It's warm weather. My plants are growing. Some of them blooming in February. It's apparent that I'm not cold. I've been sitting out here for about an hour. Pretty obvious that there's a testimony here. That there's a witness. So I got a good news for you. I got an idea for you. You know when the elections come your way and all these people are going to send you, sign up for this, do this, be that, get this, get that, and all the other things? Why don't you go fishing instead? You know, I mean, I'm going to be straight up with you. If you don't want to go fishing for men, which is okay, Jesus let the disciples go fishing. But then he sent them out afterwards. So, if you think that you need to get involved in politics and all that junk, go ahead. And, you know, if you come out of it with peace, love, and joy, let me know. And I'll tell you, maybe you're the exception to the rule that you got involved in the world and its ways and survived. Or, you know, try it my way. See if maybe you want to go after, you know, casting out some lines, sitting there, you know, with your buds or whatever it may be. I don't know how you go fishing. Or all alone, you know, just casting out a, you know. Some people tell me that it's a wonderful thing to sit there, you know, with a fishing pole and just snooze. Well, I did, you know. A couple times I went out with people, I kind of fell asleep. <laughs> I liked it, but oh well. They were catching fish, I was sleeping. So, go out in a boat. Go fishing. Don't get involved in politics. Don't get involved in the world. Don't be all caught up in what's happening in the world that you don't notice the signs of the times 
and that Jesus is coming soon. Because if you don't pay attention, you won't just be left behind. You won't realize that you've become part of the problem and not following Jesus. So today, you know, maybe you don't want to follow God. Maybe you don't want to go to church. Maybe you don't want to do any of those things, you know. If you're expecting an altar call now, forget it. Maybe you want to, you know, do your own thing. Go do it. You know, I mean, somebody got, I guess, upset at me because uh, some guy asked me, well, what should I do? He's telling me about how he's tempted by sin. I said, go sin, get it over with. I said, you'll hate it. It'll be miserable for you. But until you do it, you're just going to pretend like it's a wonderful thing. And at the time you do it, you'll feel great. Ah, oh, I sinned. Oh, that was so good. And I can guarantee you before the sun goes down, God will make you feel like crap. Because you'll notice things start going wrong. And they will. God doesn't bless your sin. God makes you feel convicted from your sin. God does, not you. So, hey, you know, if, if you're stupid enough to, you know, do it the hard way, go sin. Go go get involved in politics. And then at the end of it, realize you got duped. Again. You failed again. When you wanted to vote, God said, go fishing. Funny how God works that way. He'll use something you love to distract you from something he hates so that you'll get involved with something he wants you to do. So if you love fishing, go fishing. He'll meet you out there on the water and he'll show you what he wants you to do with your love of fishing. If you're a canoeist, you know, and you're really that carried away about canoes, you know, you'll meet somebody. But bring God with you in what you're doing. Don't leave him outside of what you're doing. Don't make him second fiddle or number two, but do what you would do if you were following through with what you said you would do when you asked Jesus to be Lord of your life. Because if you do, then maybe you'll be like me. That come election day, you'll have gone fishing. 